Hey everyone, welcome to ONTAP. I'm Chris, your host, and today we'll be talking about what was once the beer of the British Empire and is still produced today, Bass. The Bass Brewery was founded in 1777 by Mr. William Bass. Coincidentally, this was at the same time as the American Revolution, or American War of Independence, depending on which side of the pond you live on, was raging. So while British regulars and Continental soldiers were facing off with their flintlocks on the east coast of North America, back in England, such a conflict probably didn't concern Mr. Bass, who was really just looking to brew some good beer. He founded a brewery in Burton-upon-Trent in Staffordshire, England, and started exporting the beer locally. But at that time, in the late 1700s, there was actually really growing demand for beer in, of all places, the Baltic, especially the port of St. Petersburg. See, this was helped probably in no small part by the fact that in the late 1700s, Imperial Russia, under the rule of Catherine the Great, was really starting to cement itself as a major European power. And additionally, the city of St. Petersburg that had been originally founded by Catherine's predecessor, Peter the Great, in the early 1700s, had, by the end of the century, several decades to turn into, well, an actual city befitting a major imperial power. And so from their port of St. Petersburg, a window into Europe, if you will, the Russians could now import pretty much whatever they wanted, such as beer. Bass took advantage of this business opportunity, and he started exporting his English beer to the port of St. Petersburg. Oh, and also a, a total aside, Catherine the Great was apparently a massive fan of extra high strength English stout, and under her reign, she oversaw a massive increase in importation of this style of beer, which is allegedly where we get the term Russian Imperial Stout. The Bass Brewery continued to expand through the rest of Mr. Bass's life and through the life of his son afterwards, and by the mid-1800s was a very successful company. So successful, in fact, that unscrupulous brewers were taking advantage of the Bass name. And what they would do is just fill up a barrel with whatever beer they wanted to sell, put the Bass label on the front, and just sell it off. People would be none the wiser. So what the Bass Company decided to do was develop what we now think of as the very well-known Red Triangle as a form of trademark. In 1875, this Red Triangle actually became the first registered trademark in the United Kingdom. By the late 1800s, the brewery was doing very well. They were producing over 1 million barrels of beer, and again, that's in 1877, I believe, and those are British barrels of beer, or 36 gallons a barrel. And unsurprisingly, the brewery found that its fortunes became very much tied to that of the British Empire, at its height during the mid-19th to about early mid-20th century. Bass beer was exported throughout the empire, and pretty much, if you could find a Union Jack, you could find Bass Ale. It was sold throughout Canada, Australia, New Zealand, Hong Kong, India, South Africa, pretty much everywhere and the fortunes of the company only continued to climb. By 1935, when the FTSE 30 launched, um, and for uh, viewers who aren't in the UK, the FTSE 30 is basically the British equivalent of like a NASDAQ or Dow Jones or the DAX, if you're in Germany. Um, and this brewery was included on that list. Bass was one of the, the original companies on the FTSE 30. Through the mid 20th century, the company continued to acquire smaller companies, but it started to run into a bit of a rough patch by the end of the 20th century. And in 2000, Bass was purchased by the mega conglomerate AB InBev. And at that point, things did seem to take a turn for the worse for the label. Currently, Bass is one of AB InBev's many, many holdings, something that I think most people could argue did the company absolutely no favors, the company being Bass. The last 20 years have marked pretty much the lowest point ever for the Bass label, though in the past couple years, uh, AB InBev has started producing and marketing the beer a bit more heavily, so we'll see what happens. Currently, production of the beer is around 300,000 barrels a year and change. Those are British barrels. So it's not exactly a huge brewery, but it's not a microbrewery either. Right now, the beer is not exactly common in the U.S., but you can find it well enough in most American cities. Where it's still sold best is, of course, in Britain, the home market, which is unsurprising. We'll see what happens in the coming years, depending on what the parent company decides to do with the Bass label. And maybe we'll see more Bass beer in the years to come. These days, pretty much the only main Bass beer that is sold widely is the Bass Pale Ale. 
This is a quintessential English pale ale that is going to be malty with a little bit of sweetness and dryness. And despite the name, pale ale, it is actually a more sort of light chestnut brown color. Bass also sells a Bass IPA and stout, though I personally have not been able to find this really anywhere where I live in the US. Though I've seen online it might be sold in some pockets such as I think Illinois, Car the Carolinas, and Kentucky. But if anyone knows anything more about that, please let me know in the comments. I'd love to get your thoughts. And I've also read that there are some lower alcohol strength sort of cask ales that Bass sells, but those are pretty much just in the UK. And again, information on that is not terribly withstanding. Bass also sells a do-it-yourself black and tan pub kit. And for those of you who don't know, which I'm assuming is most people outside of the UK or Anglo Commonwealth, a black and tan is basically a beer where you take a light colored beer, pour it into the glass about halfway, and then using a very specific technique, pour in a dark colored beer to fill up the rest of the glass. When you set the beer down, you've got a light beer on the bottom, dark beer on the top, and a nice color contrast with a black and tan color, thus the name. Black and Tan was also a uh, paramilitary organization that was pro-unionist and against Irish independence fighting in Northern Ireland in the 1920s. And let's just say that uh, some bad things happened, some people were killed, some more crimes were committed, and eventually things got bad enough that both the Irish and British governments condemned the organization. So on that cheery note, let's move on to tasting. It's now time to try the Bass Pale Ale. Now, I apologize, but I only have the classic Bass Pale Ale to try today. As I referenced in the last section, getting a hold of some of the other types of beer that Bass makes, at least where I am in the US, um, even in a major city, is extremely difficult. So this is all that we're gonna be doing, but I hope that is okay. So there it is, we can see. It is, yeah, indeed, a sort of a light, lightish brown, um, slightly chestnut color. And, taste, yeah, and. That's very nice. That's nice. It has, it has that good flavor of an English beer you'd get in a pub, which is exactly what this is. It's very much a malty beer. Uh, it doesn't have, there's not really a lot of hops that I'm getting out of this. It's definitely going to be on that s sort of smoother, slightly heavier almost, if you will, maltier side. Yeah, it's kind of an, it's a um, amber light brown mix of some malt and a little bit of sweetness. And maybe, maybe I could be making this up. There might be something like an orange, like it's not, it's not quite... It's not orange, it's not like, oh, this beer tastes like there's orange in it, but there's something about the sweetness. Could be molasses. I'm not quite sure what it is, but the like where the sweetness is coming from, it's not just like sugar. It's not just a, oh, this is sweet, like with a cider, where you've got the sugar that's occurring from the fruit, and that's sort of giving the drink this kind of sweet flavor. Here, it's a it's a very subtle sweetness. It's not really on the tip of your tongue, but it's kind of hidden in there, along with mostly a a kind of soothing malty flavor. Yeah, I mean, it works for me, and this is definitely something that I would order if I were in a pub. Having tried this, I would say this is a good kind of starter beer in the world of English pale ales. If you're an American and you maybe aren't super familiar with English beers or especially English pale ales, this is gonna be a very nice beer for you to get a sense of what English pale ales are about. It's very easy to drink. Um, it's a little darker and it's got that nice kind of um, malt taste to it, but in which there's a little bit of that very, very subtle sweetness. Um, and so it means that there's a little bit more going on with this beer than something like a Heineken or a Stella or a, or a Bex or some kind of basic table lager. This isn't gonna be groundbreaking. It's not gonna be something where you're gonna be thinking, wow, this is really top shelf artisanal craft beer. It's not that, uh, but it's gonna be a cut above a lot of the really, really basic stuff. Um, and if you want to get a bit of a sense of that, like I want to try a beer that has some slightly more complicated flavors, 
um, while not really hitting me over the head with way too much hops or you know no chocolate notes or anything like that, but sort of this middle of the road place where there's some interesting flavor profile, but it's not too much. And it's very easy to have you know a couple of these. Ideally, you'd actually have them in big uh, 20 ounce British Imperial glasses, not the not the 16 ounce ones that people tend to get in the States. And you're having this with a couple friends by the fire um, where it's you know maybe a little dark. Uh, you can have it, but outdoor on a patio as well. And it's very doable in a, in a variety of environments, but you know, like with a lot of beers that you would drink in an environment like England, um, this is not gonna be a good hot weather beer, but in a sort of English environment where it's not too hot, it's not too cold, it's maybe a little rainy, kind of cloudy, or it's, you know, it's, it's nighttime and you're at the pub, um, this is a good sort of beer to have. If you are, however, somewhere where you can get access to more local um, craft pale ales, both in England or in the US, uh, I would probably think you wanna go for that. Um, this is gonna be, again, more of a sort of a standard style English pale ale, which by the way, is a version of pale ales that I, I personally tend to prefer, just cause I prefer beers that are a bit maltier rather than um, hoppier, and I, at least from my experience, the English um, do a do a very good job of getting that sort of malt flavor in there with just you know, a little bit of hops, but but not too much. Whereas Americans, their pale ales in the main are gonna be definitely more on the hoppy side. So if you prefer that, those are probably gonna be for you. Thanks for watching, everyone. If you are feeling so adventurous, why not go ahead and leave a like on this video and subscribe to the channel.